37? 
26.
turn to the book of Galatians to chapter 5. <clears throat> book of Galatians chapter 5. The Apostle Paul wrote this letter to those churches that were scattered throughout the region of Galatia. In this book, several things are mentioned concerning reproof um, and also warning, but also good instruction needed, practical godliness, wonderful doctrine, clearing up confusion. There's just a number of things that this book addresses that the Apostle Paul mentions here. But we want to read about this very special part of Galatians and known as the section on the fruit of the Spirit. So we're going to read here Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 through 26. Galatians 5, verse 16 through 26. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. May the Lord bless the reading of His Word this morning. There are some, definitely a lot of things that are mentioned here. The lists that the Apostle Paul give, some of these things are indicative of death, some of these things are indicative of life. So when we talk about the fruit of the Spirit, we oftentimes associate it with an evidence. And that's what fruit is. Fruit is an evidence of something. I've said to you before um, that when Jesus Christ came to this earth, uh, He didn't come just to make you know, bad men good. He came to make dead men live. And so we see that there is something that's, that's even more superior than just being a good person, Right? Uh, the question is, are we living people? And you say, well, that's a ridiculous question. Aren't we all here breathing and, uh, and aren't our hearts beating? We have evidence of life, right, that we are alive. And that's exactly my point, though I'm not speaking just about a carnal life. I'm not talking about your natural life being, you know, evident, though that it's clear. You know, we're all sitting upright this morning. Nobody is killed over. Praise God for that. We're thankful for that, right? Um, how terrible that would be. But nevertheless, we, we understand that there is evidence. When there's evidence of life, we, we rejoice in that, don't we? We're thankful for that. I'm thankful to see you all alive this morning. But there's also evidences of life that we need to take note of and that we need to be uh, aware of, right? And this evidence that the Lord gives of the life of the Spirit of God within us. And so this here, He's brought to us the, the, to our attention that there is a fruit a fruit of that Spirit. Now, the doctrine of the regeneration. This is a very important doctrine. I don't know if there ever goes a Sunday that I don't mention about you know, something about regeneration, about that new creature, the one that we just sang about, You know how it is the Lord uh, finishing that new creation within us, as uh, Wesley wrote in that hymn, uh, that, that God himself has started and begun a work in you. The Bible tells us that he will, uh, he, he will finish that work which He has begun in us, and that work that He's going to finish is we expect that to happen when Jesus Christ returns. But when did He begin this? Well, He began that work of regeneration, that new creation, that giving to us a spirit of life 
at the point when the Spirit of God, by grace, came and abode in our heart, right? Making our heart clean, making our heart new. He takes an old, stony, carnal flesh, sinful nature heart, and he uh, plants into us then a new heart, a new living, beating uh, heart for God, if you will. Uh, a spiritual heart, though, it is. Uh, it's the center and the seat of the soul in which the Lord has given to, given to us also. So this spirit that he has given to us, this new heart, this, all these things are a part of this new creation. And so if it's alive, then we might also see evidence of it being alive. And here the Lord is telling us through the Apostle Paul that there are some evidences that we can see in one who has been born or has been made new by this spirit of God. Now, there's certain evidences that we just read, too, that that old flesh nature, though it's dead, is still alive and apparent, right? And, and we see these things not only in our world today, but also celebrated in our world today. Things like idolatry and witchcraft, adultery and fornication, uncleanness and lasciviousness, uh, hatred and variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, all those things he mentions in, through verses 19 and 21. He lists off those things. Those are the things of the lust of the flesh. Now that flesh that we have, you know, this is what we've inherited from Adam. You know, the man who was in the Garden of Eden, the first of God's creatures, right, of human creatures. And, and when he made Adam, he made him to be upright and good. He made, gave him everything he needed to succeed and obey his word, his commandments. But, but Adam, of course, uh, still fell into sin by going and rebelling against God's word, uh, doing his own thing, right? Not following God's word. So uh, in him was found sin. And sin then was also passed down upon all of his posterity, all of his children would receive. And certainly see evidence that we are Adam's children because we all can confess honestly that we have sinned and come short of the glory of God. If we're being honest, we can all admit that, can't we? Uh, so we, we see the evidence of it not only in ourselves, but we see it evidenced in the world. As I've mentioned already, that it's been celebrated. It's, it's something that people are proud of. But nevertheless, here we see that the Apostle Paul is saying that these things, the, the, this lusts of the flesh, this, this fruit of wickedness, if you will, these dead works, he's saying that often our flesh lusts after those things. It desires these things that are forbidden. But he says, you now, being new creatures, being uh, people of God, no longer aliens and foreigners to God, but now have been uh, made his, his people, are capable, now are capable, have been enabled to do the things that are spiritual and not just carnal. To do the things that are after God and not just the things that are after Adam. In fact, he's saying that you can choose to do the things that are of God, and to re reject and refuse the things that are of Adam, in which we should. This is known as repentance. This is, a, this is the act of repenting from our sins. This is the act of turning away from those wicked things that we used to do, or those things that our, that our flesh nature is often inclined to do, desires to do, lusts after. We have power to put those things away, and to choose to do that which is good. And so the things that he's saying here that are good to do make up something important. It's known as the fruit, the fruit of the Spirit. Now notice that's a singular word, not a plural word. He says the fruit of the Spirit. Why? Because there's only one fruit that is born of the children of God, right? There's only one fruit, but yet it has nine graces to it, okay? Nine parts to this one fruit. And we, are, we need to take something away from that, that, that this, this being told us why it's not plural and why it is singular. <clears throat> it's because I think whenever we read these fruit of the Spirit, right, we read this, these, these parts or these pieces of the fruit of the Spirit, uh, <clears throat> we oftentimes look at it and we think to ourselves, well, here I am, I'm more inclined to uh, be a loving person or a joyful person but, you know, I, I, I don't think that I have within me the ability or uh, the, the, the capability to be long-suffering or gentle to other people. And God's saying, nope, that's not how it works. <clears throat> when God says that He desires for us to demonstrate this fruit of the Spirit, He's saying, I've not only uh, made you capable of bearing fruit, but you're also capable of bearing all facets of it. 
that we don't get to pick and choose which one we like or which one we feel like we are, are, are better and more capable of bearing because it's all one fruit. You see, all children of God are supposed to bear all nine portions of this one particular fruit. And this is something that we understand is not anything that obviously that comes natural to us, as we've just explained. What comes natural to us is sin and our bent for sinning, right? What comes supernaturally to us are the things of the fruit of the Spirit, right? These things that we've just read to you, okay? Now, over the next few weeks, nine, I guess, um, <clears throat> give or take, however many it takes, we're going to be talking about these fruit of the Spirit. So, Lord willing, we hope to talk about the first one and perhaps the most superior part of the fruit of the Spirit, which is love today. But the fruit of the Spirit here is to serve a purpose, right? All these things are meant to serve, all these parts of the fruit of the Spirit are meant to serve a purpose. And we're supposed to understand that these things are not things we pick and choose, but rather we choose to bear all the parts of this and to not hide anything that is mentioned here of love, of joy, of peace, of long-suffering, of gentleness, goodness, faith, or meekness, temperance. And so these things that we are, are, are told to offer and, and to give through our ways of life and behavior, these things have a purpose and serve something, right? And I think it's most obvious what it serves, right? It serves to the glory of God. When we are patient, it serves to the glory of God, right? Long-suffering, that's what that word means. It means patience. Whenever it is that we are joyful, it ought to be things that are, that are worthy of us rejoicing in for it to be glorifying unto God. Well, how about love? And how does love serve these things? Well, love is meant to be something that we use that is given by us, uh, to us by God that is actually something divine. This isn't something, once again, none of these things are things that come to us naturally. These are all things that come to us supernaturally. So don't think that just anybody in the world can just be a, you know, a patient person, uh, a truly patient person, a truly joyful person, a truly uh, 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 loving person or gentle person without the work of God first being worked within them. You see, the thing about this fruit is that it follows after life. Evidence points to the, the, the first thing that happened, right? The evidence is pointing to the first thing that happened, which is regeneration, the principal thing, the cause. These, this fruit that is mentioned here are the effects of that cause of regeneration, the work of the spirit of regeneration in your heart. And so we, we need to get an understanding of, of these things. And so that's why I feel like we have to go through each one of these individually to talk about their importance of them. And so today I think the biggest one of all these, and that's why I said it's the most superior part of it, is because love is, as we were just saying, is love that excels all things, right? It excels the love of any other uh, form or, 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 or shape that it can take in this world. And certainly there are lots of ways in which love is mis represented in our world today. It's not uncommon to hear a, a song, you just turn on the radio and you hear a song about love. And you think, well, if it's a song about love, which is probably the greatest, you know, the biggest subject uh, that, any, you know, that songwriters or artists have ever written about, right? Um, love, you turn on, the, turn on the radio about love and you, know, and you hear a song about it and you think to yourself, well, you, Certainly I'm going to hear about a good subject, but then you hear what follows after the words love is mentioned, and it's oftentimes things that are, you know, disgusting or things that are certainly contrary to God's word, whatever it might be. And you think, well, is that really what love is? And the sad thing is, is that children oftentimes hear these songs, right? Or uh, people who have not been taught any better out of God's word about what love is hear that, and this is what they end up thinking that love is. Uh, they end up thinking thinking that something that is meant to be divine and spiritual is brought down to a carnal um, you know, misrepresentation of it. And this is what they walk away thinking that love is. And friends, we, need, we ought to do a better job of representing what love is and doing a good job of teaching others through our ways of behavior. And that's where we first start, is that love is something that is demonstrated through our works and actions, Right? Because after all, the fruit of the Spirit are all things that we demonstrate through our behavior. Right? The fruit of the Spirit is something we demonstrate through our behavior. This isn't anything that we just say, well, I believe these things, and we never actually do them. That's not bearing fruit. 
we can all say that I agree that these things are very good, but happy are ye if you do them, right? This is what the Lord has told us about foot washing. Well, I think the same applies to us when it comes to the fruit of the Spirit. Happy are you if you're performing these things. You're a blessing to other people if you actually put these things in motion. So love is the first place that we will go and we'll see. But we know we need to know... Uh, what well, we need before we actually go to love, we want to go and see just a few things here. Over in the book of First Peter, First Peter chapter uh, two, the importance, the importance of having a, you know, bearing this fruit, and why? Why does it serve? What purpose does it serve? First Peter chapter two. In verse 12, the Apostle Peter here encouraging these believers to exercise godly behavior, right? To bear the fruit of the Spirit. So for a purpose that others may speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Okay? You and I serve a purpose of representing, uh, giving a true representation of who God is before other people. How do we do that? Through bearing the fruit of the Spirit. Think about this. All these things are first found in God. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, temperance. All these things are first found in God. He gives to us of His divine nature. He gives to us of something that is not natural to us, but rather, as I said, supernatural to us. Right? Extraordinary. This isn't ordinary gifts. These aren't ordinary gifts. These are extraordinary gifts that he gives to us. And so uh, we are meant to be an extraordinary people. Now, I'm not saying this to make you high-minded or to puff you up or to give you pride because actually those things go contrary to what we're supposed to be learning this morning, right? Meekness and gentleness, right? Those things are contrary to pride. So if we hear that we are of God, right, and we hear that, uh, that we are an extraordinary people and we're of a supernatural uh, existence, we can't allow those things to make us puffed up or else we are, we're, we're in fact negating these fruit of the Spirit. Okay? What is the... Word of God tells us over in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Right? So this all point to God. It's never supposed to point to us. Our love that we give to other people, it should demonstrate a godliness about us that other people, when they behold it and when they feel it and when they sense it, they thank God for it. Right? And so what we're doing when we behave this way, it was saying, you know, it, well, well, thank you for loving me. Well, thank God that he's given us love in the first place. You know, we, we sang the, the, the hymn earlier, uh, My God, I did not choose you, for that could never be. You know, we sing that hymn, and in there it's, a, it's, a, it, it's exposing to us, right? It's teaching us about how God is the cause, the cause of all things, right? The cause of all good that is in this world. Uh, and the cause of love begins with him, because the Word of God tells us that uh, we love him, because he first loved us. We just sang that this morning. So we can't take something that isn't natural to us um, and, and you know, that we have not invented and try to make it our own or else we've perverted that thing. We've got to understand what God intends for us to do with love, how to use it, and how to properly represent it in this world. And I'll tell you here, when we understand how it, God has, uh, has intended for us to use love, it then serves us better that way. It serves us better. It's, it will work how it's supposed to work. You know, Dad always told me that you're not supposed to use things that aren't intended, right? And when you're, when you're using a tool in, in, you know, in, in your garage or on your vehicle or when you're you know, working on your house, use the tool that is intended for that purpose. There's often times that I might you know, try to use my hand to hammer down something you know, that's a little loose, and my dad would say, oh, you're going to hurt your hand that way. You know, you're going to break the bones in your hand. And, you know, and you're thinking, like, this is pretty innocent, but you know, this, is, this is what I was inclined to do. It felt like I could just do that really quickly. Well, Dad, Dad quickly corrected me. No, you get a tool for that. 
Because your hand isn't intended to be a hammer, right? The hammer is intended to be the hammer. Well, God has given to us something that is, that is intended to be used, and it will serve, it'll serve Him, but it also serves us in this world too. Because there are things that flow, back, flow down from it whenever it is that we use it properly. But when we misuse it and abuse it well, that's when a world of problem comes to us, right? A world of problems come to us. So this love, this character that exceeds all things. Let's go over here to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 14. love that we are supposed to demonstrate, right? This uh, putting in action, this uh, preference of others and giving, giving to others um, our charity, which is how it's described in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. This word is used, charity. We're going to go there in just a second too and see what love is, what charity is, and what it isn't. But before we do that, we want to see the importance of why expressing love and using this love is important and how it opens up something for us. Okay, Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 19. For this cause, the apostle here writing to the Ephesians, for this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. That includes all the elect of God, right? There's no one here that's left out in terms of the elect of God. I'm here on earth but I've got loved ones in heaven, you do too, who are in heaven, and God's children that are there. We're all part of the same family. He says here, the, For this cause I bow my knee unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. God's elect in heaven and in earth. That He would grant you, according to the riches of His glory, to be strengthened with might by His Spirit in the inner man. Okay, we just talked about that inner man. It's talking about the, 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 the spirit of regeneration that has been worked within you. You are a new creature. You are a, That's that inner man uh, that he is referring to there. Verse 17, That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love. Rooted and grounded in love. You see what love is? It's love is, serves to be an anchor an anchor for us, right? To rooted and grounded in love. Well, in love for who? Well, first of all, for the love for our God, right? Love of our Savior. We can go back to the Old Testament and read in there in Exodus chapter 20 about all these things that are listed there that you're not supposed to do. Right? Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not covet, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not commit adultery. Uh, honor thy father and thy mother, right? Um, you know, thou shalt not bear, make unto thee any graven images. Thou shalt not have any other gods before me. There's a bunch of things there that you're either supposed to do or not do. But where is love ever mentioned in any of those Ten Commandments, right? When Jesus arrives, right, here on earth, he says that the whole of the law and the prophets are all summarized in two commandments. Two commandments. And the first one, he says is to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and with all thy might. Okay? He understands that this is given to a people who are capable of loving Him. So if it is that you are not loved of God, there's no way that you're going to love Him. You know, the, the dead natural man does not desire to love God. The person who is reprobate in their way of thinking and their way of behavior um, has no desire to love God, doesn't give a thing, a care, a care about God, right? Doesn't care at all about Him. But you this morning, if you care to know more about your God, I tell you it's because He first loved you. If He has called you this morning uh, and you feel that burden upon, upon you to come and worship Him and to acknowledge Him and to thank Him for the blessings that you've received, it's because He has enabled you and made you able to do those things of serving Him and worshiping Him this morning and giving thanks. You see, He is the cause of your life. And so if you love Him this morning, it is because He first loved you. And so you're going to be rooted and grounded in this love for Him. But that's not also what you're rooted and grounded in. You're also rooted and grounded in that second great commandment, which is to love your neighbor as yourself. Right? Yes, yeah, that, that vertical love, and now we have the horizontal love, right? This is the one that we give to God, and then there's the one that we give to each other. And, and so how do we know how to do that? Well, God has taught us. Yes, you're taught how to love. 
And so you're taught how to love others by the way in which God loves you. You see that Christ demonstrated that love all throughout his ministry, publicly, and in the greatest of ways when it is that he gave his life for us. You see the example that is laid before us and how that is a mighty big example, right? It is a mighty big uh, task that we have before us. But yeah, this isn't something that someone holds you at gunpoint and says you have to do it. This is something that rather I feel that we are compelled by the Spirit of God to do. We are led rather by Him to do this, to love one another. But when we do it, friends, this is doing something within us. It's rooting us and grounding us in Him even deeper, right? And our love for Him grows deeper because our love has got to grow. His love for us has always been constant at an everlasting level, right? Constantly at an everlasting level. His love for us is eternal. It's unending. He's always loved us. There's never been a time in which He hasn't loved us. He's always loved us. But our love for Him can and needs to grow. And so this is where our roots begin to grow deeper and deeper and deeper. But we have to understand how important love is and the, point that it, uh, the part that it plays in our lives. And this is also important here that we read further on. It says in verse 18, that's where we've been rooted and grounded in love, that we may be able to comprehend with all saints, right? All of us together, because we're all working to grow in love, that we may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. As our love for Christ grows, and our love for brothers and sisters grows, right? Our, our, our fellow brothers and sisters grows. This opens up. This opens up our Lord, right? And what I mean is that we, we begin to learn more about Him and our depth for him and our knowledge of depth, uh, the depth of knowledge rather I should say for him grows and it gets larger, it expands. The more you love your brothers and sisters, the more you're witnessing and seeing in this dark and, and, and dreadful world at times, the more you're beginning to see the great love that your father has for you. And not only that, but it helps to show other people the great love that the Father has for them too, that their Savior has for them. And then whenever you see it opening up, whenever you, when you see brothers and sisters alike loving one another, and when you see that their love for the Savior is growing as well, then you begin to experience God in a deeper way. The key is love. This is what it's always been. Sometimes we harp on, on truth, right? And we say, well, truth is so important. Absolutely truth is important. What you need to know is the truth about love itself, too, is that it can't be missing, that it's so central and important because if we don't have truth with us, or excuse me, if we don't have love with us, then truth really doesn't even matter all that much. We're just, uh, we're, we're, we're just yelling out facts, when we're meant to be a people who have a richer, deeper experience with the truth itself. Okay, go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I've always said this, is, you know, this chapter explains to us what love is and what love isn't. And if we would come here and measure, when you hear that word love, you know, just shout it out or, 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 or you know, flippantly just used, when you hear it, Come over here to 1 Corinthians 13 and read what love is and what love isn't and see if the, what, you know, in what capacity it's being used, if it's actually love or if it's something that is actually alien to God. See if it's genuine or not. Okay? 1 Corinthians 13. We don't have time to just explain all these things but we will at least um, go through them uh, briefly here. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1 says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not charity, which is love, okay? This is this love that God gives to us. It's not inherent to us, but rather it's divine. I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy... And understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am 
nothing. He's saying that everything that we could do in the church, if, it doesn't, if it's not combined or mixed with love, he says it's all in vain. He said, well, that's a church over there that preaches a lot of truth, and they have the truth with them, but if they don't have any love, friends, they're not serving the Lord. What that looks like is a very pharisaical, legalistic church, okay? That we're all about truth and never about any love, and so there's never any compassion. I'll tell you, it's never going to draw people into it unless you just like being abused. I mean, some people are gluttons for punishment, I suppose, but it's not the church that I think that we're supposed to be here. It's clear that Paul is saying that, listen, truth and all these other things that matter, and at the time, you know, prophecies and, and, uh, and, and faith and all, all these things were important. And even if you had the faith to remove mountains, he said, the, the faith that could conquer, you know, grand things, but yet you don't have charity. If you're, if you're just an ugly, difficult person to be around, you know, what does it matter? You see, love is that sweetness, a genuine sweetness. The sweetness is actually good for you, right? It's, it's the thing that is good for us that we need to feel as with a spiritual sense now, with a spiritual sense, not just emotional, but a spiritual sense. We need to sense that by faith that that love is good for us and that we are being nurtured. We're being nurtured by God through His people. So he says here that though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor and though I give my body to be burned, right? We could all do that. We could all just go you know, hand some, some money over to poor people. But if there's not any love and intention to see that, you know what? I really want this to serve you well because I want this for your benefit and your blessing. I hope to see you do better because I know, I trust that the Lord loves you. And I want to express my love for you too because I want to genuinely see you do well. And it's not, you know, if it's not with love, then it's just, a, it's just a show. That's all it is. It's just a show. Now, the person who needs it will take it regardless, right? They, they need it. And that purpose is served for, you know, that. But if we also, with the gift that we give, give them a gift of love, too. And I think sometimes what we need to do is more than just extend money, but also an arm, an arm of kindness, an arm of genuine help, Right? He says, though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. He didn't say it didn't profit them, but he said it profits me nothing. It doesn't do me any good, right? Because love is supposed to teach us something. It's supposed to open up Christ to us. We're supposed to understand what is the depth and the breadth of it all, right? The height of, of Him. And we, aren't we a people who desire to know more about our Savior God? Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Okay, so here we're getting into what it is and what it isn't. Charity suffereth long, is patient, and is kind. It, charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself. That means it doesn't boast about itself. We see love as if it's something to be just proud of. You know, love isn't anything to be proud of. Love is something to be thankful for. There's a difference, isn't there? It vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly. Well, I just love the way that you're misbehaving, child, you know. <laughs> no, I don't love it. I'm not talking about any child that's crying right now. <laughs> that's bad timing. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> that was right. But our love is meant to, you know, it was meant to encourage good works, not bad works. Charity suffereth long as kind, charity envieth not, charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked. Love is something that is not selfish, it is selfless, right? It's not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. Listen to this. This one is the one that really, I think, is so contrary to how it's used in our world today. Rejoiceth not in iniquity. If you can just remember that part of it. When we see that word used today, Remember just a few years ago um, when there was a ruling in the courts made about um, marriage. You know, when you saw this hashtag being thrown around social media, social media is called um, Love Wins. Love Wins, right? Well, it was a decision that was made that goes against the way that the Lord has intended for marriage to be defined. Okay, so there was taking this marriage that's something that God, God has given to us that is meant to bless God and also bless His people. 
That's what marriage is meant to be. But when we take something and we you know, transform it into what you know, sinful man wants, we're abusing, misusing, and that's sin. Sin is the misuse or abuse of God's gifts to us. Okay? And there's no difference when it comes to love as well. It can be abused and misused as well. And that's sin. Well, love doesn't rejoice in iniquity. Love doesn't look at someone who is in sin and say, you know, I love, I love what you're doing. That's not love. Because God doesn't love us that way. He hates our sin. He does not love when we sin. He loves us despite everything we've done, but he doesn't love our sin. He doesn't love the things that we're doing whenever it is that we are abandoning his word. It doesn't rejoice in iniquity, but it rejoices in the truth. The truth is, is that sin is harmful to us, whether we see the consequences ahead that lay ahead of us or not. We, right now, we, we, you know, we, it's very present and evident to us that, that there are folks who cannot perceive the consequences of sin. And that's why there's such a, such a great rebellion over a lot of the, of the things that have become political that should have never become political, but they are, unfortunately. There's a great rebellion out there of, of, of you know, being able to control one's body and being able to you know, do whatever they want to to a pregnancy. And there's no regard of thought to what happens if they go through with this destruction of this life within them. But they think that this is just, you know, that it's just a, an ending of, a, of an inconvenience. There is a consequence to that many lives, millions of lives being lost that we cannot even begin to comprehend. I don't rejoice in that. Do you? If we really love these people, right, who have actually done these things, and we need to. We need to love them. But don't rejoice in that iniquity. Don't rejoice in the lie that there are no consequences to these things. Because love doesn't rejoice in those things. Love tells them, you know, there's a truth to this. But there's also a God who can overcome these things for us. There's a pain that is felt, right? And not just, I mean, you know, I'm talking about these, these real matters that our country has faced over the past few weeks and months and years. But, um, but it could be applied to anything. It could be applied to anything. Love and charity itself, it doesn't rejoice in iniquity. And it rejoices rather in the truth. It beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never fails. And that's the thing we need to carry with us the most. You'll never go wrong if you just love God's people the way Christ loves them. Right? Despite all the other things they've done, just love them with the love that the Lord Jesus Christ loves them. And how does he love them? Okay, we'll go over to that now to John chapter uh, 13. John chapter 13. The Apostle John wrote about love perhaps more than anybody in the Bible. Okay? He loved, he loved the, the subject of love. He highlighted it in his gospel account, and he mentions it um, probably more than any other word in, in his first epistle. And so here over in John chapter 13, <clears throat> verse 31, it says, Therefore when he was gone out, that is, Jesus said, um, <clears throat> Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in, in himself, and shall straightway glorify him. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. Ye shall seek me. And as I said unto the Jews, whither I go, ye cannot come. So now I say unto you, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. Notice who he's directing this love to. He's saying, this is a new commandment that I'm giving to you, and you are meant to love one another. How? As I have loved you. We go on in chapter 15 to find out that there's greater love hath no man than this. Right? Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. He says, ye are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Okay? His commandment has 
just been presented to us, right? This new commandment he just given, just been presented to us. And it's to love one another as I have loved you. Love him to the point that if you are, if it came down to it, you will be willing to give your life. You're, give, you're willing to give your life. Because that's the point in which Jesus Christ loved us, isn't it? Can we argue with that? Can we argue that Jesus didn't love us enough to give his life for us? He absolutely did love us to the point of death. He didn't regard death as being something that was, you know, too valuable, right? His life being too valuable uh, in order to not lay it down for us and not love us with that. But he did. He loved us even to the point of death. As John wraps up his epistle, he says he loved them to the end. Okay? Well, it doesn't mean that his, his love has ended for us. He, what does he mean? He, his, his earthly time. He loved them to the very end of this earthly time. And guess what? He's still loving us now. He's just loving us from a throne in glory. So the fruit of the Spirit of love comes with this understanding, right? That we have, if we're going to love, it's to a point that's more extreme than just what's sung about by, you know, Paul McCartney, okay? Uh, than, than what, or any other pop singer these days is singing about. You know, Paul McCartney wrote a song about silly love songs. You know, all we need is another silly, another silly love song. <laughs> these silly love songs he's talking about, he's like, you know, what do they all stand for? He said, and then he says, I'm going to write another one for you, you know, right here, and I love you, and he's singing about his wife. That's wonderful, that's good. But what we need, right, is a people, our people, who are willing to love to the point that they're willing to lay down their lives for someone, even if it were be, would be a complete stranger. That's, that's mind-blowing, isn't it? Well, I find that there's no, there's no difference in extremes. You know, there's, there's, there's no sense of real extreme with it. There's only one type of love and how it's defined. Because Christ said, love one another as I have loved you. I'm not saying that you know, you're there yet or any of us are there yet. This is something obviously we've got to mature in, isn't it? And we can all agree with that. We've got to grow in this. We've got to grow in this. But this commandment, nevertheless, is true and it stands and it's good for us. John wrote about it again. He said, a new commandment give I unto you. But then he says, this is no new commandment. Because what, what does he mean by that? He says it's a new commandment, but it's not a new commandment. What he means by that is that it's a commandment that is given to us that we love as Christ loved, but in fact it's been shown to us all throughout history that God intended to give love to us all throughout history and shown this commandment through Christ. Now, verse 35 is perhaps the most important of the verses, at least for us this morning. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. People aren't going to know that you're Jesus Christ's disciples by any other way. Not as he's truly meant to be represented. You're not going to be known as Jesus Christ's disciples, not properly at least, by how fiercely we fight for truth. You're not going to be known or by how beautiful our singing is. Or uh, how, how many church members we might have here. How much money you make. But how successful you are in your career. We're not going to be known as Jesus Christ's disciples by how correct we are. The way that people will know that we are Jesus' disciples is when we have love one to another. Because this is how it is that God was intend, intending for us to represent Him in this world. A willingness to lay down life for one another. To offer sacrifices that are pleasing unto God. To bear the fruit of the Spirit that shows, shows forth the love of God within us. Properly defined, beautifully given, accurately represented for the glory of God. Letting your light so shine before men. Is this a tough subject? It's probably it's a tough subject to speak about love. It's, it's not a, easy to define. What we have to do is we have to truly tear down a lot of the things that we've been taught about what love is, and we have to see it personified in Christ. If you ever get confused about it, go look and see how Jesus loved. There's your example. I may have done a bad job this morning of explaining it to you, but at least you can turn to Scripture and see it personified in Christ. The Bible tells us to love the Lord 
but not to love this world. Love not the world, neither the things that are in this world. Okay? Why? Because these are the things of the lust of the flesh. That's over in 1 John. Uh, we, we don't have time to go there, but, but you could go read it for yourself there. Love not the world, neither the things that are in this world. Our love is supposed to be properly directed. It's supposed to be directed to things that are of heaven, right? Not of things of this earth. Why, what, what sense does it make to give something that is so important, something that is so great, something that is divinely given to you, and to waste it, and to waste it upon things that shall perish when the Lord returns? Why, why waste it on something that you can't carry with you into glory? When we love the world so, so much, when we love the world so much, we are not representing to other people about this divine change that has happened within us that shows us that we're not of this world, but rather we're of heaven and citizens and that we have an expectation that Jesus Christ is returning. If we have an expectation He's returning, then we need to let go of the things of this earth. Not get so comfortable with them. Our walk in discipleship is actually a letting go of this world and a holding on tighter to the things of heaven and what we expect. And not only that, but does this look like a hand of praise to you? This, this to me, this, this looks like someone who is just greedy and full of lust of the flesh. We praise the Lord with open hands because we're ready to receive blessings from Him, right? We praise the Lord with open hands because we want something to be given to us, the affection of, of, of heaven, where it is that our treasure ought to be laid up. We want more of the love that He has to give to us because that's the crown, friends. That's the crown of glory. Is that that love that excels all love is what drove our Savior to die for us, to bleed for on this cross for us. The love that He had for you before the foundation of the world. And the love that He will, uh, that will last all throughout eternity. You know, He tells us that there are things that shall pass away. Now, now abide us these three, faith, hope, and charity. But the greatest of these, He says, is charity. Why? Because charity never fails. Charity never goes away. Charity will always be there. The love that God has for us will endure throughout all eternity. Faith and hope, those things shall come to a completion. But not love. Love will exceed and excel and endure. That's, that's the kind of love we ought to have for one another. Because there is no other love. Anything else is just a like or an affection or a lust. Remember that. Even the birds know how to show natural affection. Even a mother who is reprobate and wicked in her own intention knows how to show affection to a child. And praise God for that natural affection which He gives to even nature itself, right? He gives that so that these, these offspring can live. And praise God for the mother, even though that, that, that she was perhaps wicked in her intentions, and that she didn't, uh, but she at least had enough natural affection to know to keep her child so that it could be given to someone else. Who could actually love it with a godly love? The sad thing is, is there is coming a time, and I think we're in a time right now, that Romans chapter 1 speaks that they will be without natural affection. That, 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 is, that is mothers, human mothers, won't even love, have that affection for their own children, but rather despise it. Oh, friends, the love that God has for us excels. It is beyond... It is beyond natural affection. It's more than just emotion. It's a self-sacrificing, pure, enduring and endless thing that God has enabled us to give to one another. Let us love with that love. And let us also let our light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven bearing that fruit. Okay, we'll have a hymn at this time. 270. If you would desire this morning to let this church, uh, to be a part of this church and to unite with her, then we'd be happy to receive you this morning at this time. Number 270, we'll stand together and sing. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus.